Hey everybody, how's it going? Thanks for joining me this afternoon. I've got a great stream with a great guest that I think you're really going to enjoy. So I had the pleasure of meeting my guest today, Johan Kurtz. When I was over in the UK, he gave an excellent speech over at the event put on by the Beowulf Society there where I was speaking as well. And I also had the opportunity to go ahead and have him do a guest piece on my Substack recently. And it was so great that I thought I would have him join me to talk about it. Johan, thanks for coming on, man. Thank you so much for uh, for having me and, and congratulations again on 150,000. That's just an incredible achievement. Well, thank you. And I really appreciate that you were willing to come on. Like I said, the, the piece was fantastic. Everybody responded to it uh, in a very excited manner. So I definitely wanted to talk to you about it here. You delved into the idea of the university as an initiation ritual, which I think is a really important perspective that a lot of conservatives wouldn't think about. And we're going to get right into that piece in a moment. But before we do, guys, let's hear from today's sponsor. Hey, guys, I need to tell you about today's sponsor, New Founding Talent. Look, we all know that the job market is a disaster right now. Based people can't find good companies to work for and good companies can't find anybody to get the job done. The competency crisis is very, very real. So how do we get these two incredibly important groups together? We need organizations like New Founding. New Founding has created a network of high excellence professionals who are seeking to join grounded American businesses. These are individuals, often in elite organizations, who are ready for a team and a mission that supports their values instead of working against them. Aligned companies are already using this network to hire high trust, exceptional individuals who can match the culture and mission of their teams. So if you're looking for better employees to build a better world, you need to go ahead and apply for access to the New Founding Talent Network at newfounding.com backslash talent. You'll get connected with candidates who will build your business. That's newfounding.com backslash talent. Check it out today. All right, Johan, I want to go ahead and dive into the topic of the importance of initiation rituals. But before we do, a lot of people are probably unfamiliar. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? How did you get started uh, writing about things like this? Sure, yeah. So I, I used to work in uh, big tech at various companies that your employees would recognize. Um, shout out to the guys at New Founding, by the way. That's a, that's a fantastic project, and, and I also support it. Um, after that, I realized that I had an opportunity to sort of take a break in my career. And around the same time, um, I had started a family. I'd been married. I'd, I'd started having children. And I realized that I actually wanted to think about not in a reactive way, but in a proactive way. Uh, starting to build the structures that would be necessary around myself to protect my family uh, physically, yes, but also spiritually to embed them in, in very rich contexts, um, psychologically, spiritually, culturally. Um, and I started to think about what leadership in that domain was necessary. And, and as I started to think about that, I, I used writing as a tool to structure my thoughts and um, to sort of prompt me to consider new topics each week. Uh, and that became its own thing. Uh, as a result of that, I was invited to um, the event that you mentioned earlier, which I was tremendously grateful for. And, and there I met uh, yourself and, and Dave. And um, I've online got into conversations with with other people that have been on your show, like Kraptos, um, uh, who are now close friends. So it's just a sort of organic thing. Um, all of all of the writing uh, centers around the concept of I've anchored it on the subject of becoming noble, which is a question of what is the, what is the sort of complete set of considerations that we need to be taking on to establish um, a new set of elites. Uh, if, as I think most of your viewers would agree, uh, the society and the civilization that we know and love continues to, to crumble around us. And I think it's so important, like you mentioned, that people make those critical transitions. That's part of what the piece you wrote is about. But but that transition, like you said, to a family man, to a father, that changed your perspective. It changes everyone who I think goes through it. And it creates a scenario where you don't just look around at the world around you as a bunch of opportunities for yourself or possible dangers for yourself. But you understand that there's a there's a structure that's going to be around your family, around your children, your spouse, and it's going to influence them. It's going to constantly uh, be changing the way that they live their lives. And if you aren't a part of building a structure to protect them from what's out there, if you're not actively taking a role in shaping the world, the world will instead shape your family. And so I think I think just you know that that basic transition from adolescence to to manhood 
also involves critically that taking on a responsibility that you assume when you have a family. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, you can be a fantastic mentor to your sons, to your daughters. Um, but as you pass them off, as they go through the various stages of their life, first comes school and, you know, homeschooling is an option, private tutoring is an option. And I think it's fantastic that that's growing. But the, the road is a long one. Uh, and you do have to think further down the line about universities. I think, uh, and colleges, which was, which was the subject of the piece, I think it's just sort of reflexive uh, for so many people now to send their sons and, and probably worse their daughters to university, even those that think very deeply about the question of homeschool. Uh, when of course it's, it's the universities that are the progenitors of a lot of the most radicalized ideological content uh, that, that I think we have to be on guard against. And so this is, this is part of a wider set of, of uh, thinking I'm doing about what the alternative structures would be, but more importantly, how you can break out of that reflexive mindset of college is the place to go. Because I, I think you know, the impetus for this post was, well, I think it's fairly well agreed upon in our sphere. There are serious problems with the universities outside of a handful of uh, obviously aligned um, uh, institutions. That being said, most young people I know, it's not even a question in their mind, do I or do I not go to university, regardless of the financial calculation? And, and perhaps we can get into uh, the psychological aspects in, in a minute. But also for parents, you know, it's, it's just, it's such an established part of the American and, and the broader Western story, the centrality of the university, the college to the coming of age experience, um, that it doesn't really get the realistic scrutiny of what are the alternatives other than trade school, and there's nothing wrong with with trade school and, and I think a lot of people should go there but that's it's not a universal answer um, so I think it does deserve this slightly more well-rounded uh, critical analysis of how can we change this what comes next what are the deep structures incentives and assumptions that are causing um, this this sort of morass yeah I think that's critical because a lot of people myself included have looked at the university system and said something has to change obviously the first wave of this movement as you kind of mentioned there, was the, the immediate conservative reaction of, well, just don't send your kids to school. You know, don't send them to college, you know, send them to trade school, have them, have them make $200,000 a year as a plumber, right? Uh, something like that. And that looks like a good option at first glance. And for some people, as you pointed out, that is the right option. That is the right way forward. That is where their skill set lies. That's where they would best be able to serve their community. And there should, we should be working on uh, accruing a certain level of dignity to those professions that they don't currently receive. I think that is certainly part of the problem. But if you look a little deeper, you realize that the fact that kind of these high verbal skill positions, the ones which tend to shape culture, tend to shape the manipulation of information, you can't just say, we'll just go to the trades for that, Robbie. Obviously, that's something that is different. And the fact that everyone has to pass through the university for that is a critical problem. And so, for instance, I have said things like, well, we need to go ahead and have alternative certification programs that allow you to go ahead and bypass the university system. And that's a functional answer. I think that's where a lot of conservatives would go is we need to, we need to strip the function away from the university. Uh, and then I think that's certainly useful to, to go ahead and pull that away so that they don't have the monopoly on the credentialed uh, class. That I think that's really important. However, you and your piece really addressed a, a separate piece of this, which is not just the functionality, not just removing people, you know, sending them to trade school or not just giving them an alternative certification so they don't have to go to university. But you point out that actually the critical, the probably the most critical part, even as people look at the uh, university and its failures and the fact that it seems less and less of a good financial investment. Uh, even as they see that, they still send their kids for, uh, to college. And the reason for that is actually mostly spiritual, not just monetary. Can you explain a little more about that? Sure, yeah. <clears throat> so the, the sort of central conceit of the article revolves around the concept of the initiation ritual. And uh, if you look throughout the history of sociology and religion, you find that almost every major culture, even minor primitive cultures, have some conception of an initiation ritual which suggests there's something universal about the human experience that requires these. There's also this paradox that our university, at least on the surface, does not have any rituals that it accepts as initiation rituals in the traditional sense into society. Um, perhaps a little bit further on, we can sort of flesh out the typical characteristics of, of an initiation ritual. However, 
I believe that a lot of that has been sublimated into the university process. Um, so, so to define what an initiation ritual is, perhaps to make this a bit clearer, um, you may be familiar with the term uh, rites of passage, which has sort of entered into um, common discourse now as a term. Uh, this comes from a sociologist called uh, Arnold van Gennep, um, who, who was one of the first to point out that society is not actually necessarily a cohesive whole, um, but typically it breaks down into distinct groupings or sub-societies. And a rite of passage is the demarcation, the journey that an individual goes on. Excuse me one second. There we go. Uh, is a journey that an individual goes on as they transition from one section of society to another. Uh, now, these groupings might be castes, they might be classes, they might be gender differences, uh, they might be age group differences, they might be social groups, etc. Um, what is very destructive is when an individual is caught in limbo. That is, he is inhabiting a society without a clear conception of what his role is in that society, how he relates to others in the society, what his roles and responsibilities and duties are in that, that role. And so what a rite of passage is, is it is a commonly understood um, journey that a initiate that an individual goes on as he departs from one group in the in in our instance it would be a, a sort of adolescent stage into an adult stage an initiation ritual into adulthood is a sort of like uh, formalization of this um, so typically uh, Merti Aliade who's a Romanian uh, famous histori uh, historian of religion defines this as a, a body of rites and oral teachings whose purpose is to provide an alteration in the religious and social status of the person to be initiated. So it is this commonly understood ritual. You do these things, you go to this place, you are recognized as inhabiting a new place in the sort of social structure. Uh, now, this is of, of great importance um, for reasons that, that we can dig into if interesting, but you might imagine that these occupy considerations like psychological stability, um, confidence in self-conception, an acknowledgement of where one is in one's life and how one relates to the others around you, uh, how one inhabits one's place in the broader story of the history of the society that you are part of, how you relate to the leadership classes. And it, these, these kind of initiation rites, um, and it's not just school in society. I mean, to give, to give another example, um, that is perhaps uh, recognizable to people in modernity. Again, it's not a fully fledged initiation right, and it only applies to a small section of society, but would be boot camp when you go to a military. And, and part of this sort of ritualistic process is the shaving of the head to indicate that you are a new person that will have to take on new values, new disciplines, and that you have new responsibilities to fulfill. College, uh, I believe, is, is a version of this. Um, and that is part of why it seems to have such an irrational attraction to young people. They realize that financially, it might have been becoming more and more questionable as an investment for decades at this point. Uh, certainly, in some domains, it seems like a totally irrational uh, decision uh, in terms of a crass financial calculation of the debt you take on versus the, the reward you can expect to accrue. But there is some question of identity that is making it seductive and, as, and a reflexive action. Uh, and I think this question of the initiation right is, is at the heart of this. Yes, and I think it's difficult for a lot of modern people to grasp this concept because we are unfortunately entirely spiritually impoverished where we're, we're secular to the point of humiliation. And so when we look at these things, you know, we could easily identify the role of this ritual in a tribal society, right? The young man goes through some kind of spirit, you know, some vision quest, so, you know, on, on some kind of uh, symbolic hunt or something like this. This is something we would automatically recognize. But because we think of ourselves as very advanced and modern, we think that we've progressed beyond the need for these type of things. And especially in the United States, this might be less of an issue in, in, in maybe a place like the UK, but in the United States where class consciousness is something that is, that is not very normal, or at least is uh, the uh, attempt, they attempt to avoid it, even if it, if it still exists, it's very difficult for people to understand the idea of knowing a role in a space inside society. Identity is even an, a, a kind of a dirty word on the right in many places in the conservative sphere, for sure. Because the the idea is just you should always be very mobile in your class, in your station. You should never be rooted down to one place or one idea, one cast, one thing, right? You should always be able to move fluidly between these these points of 
kind of maturity in society at any moment. In fact, in many ways, the, some of the biggest problems we have is the fact that perhaps people are too fluidly able to move back to things like their childhood and live in constantly nostalgic surroundings. You, you have the Disney adult, you know, that, that kind of idea. And so it's very hard for people to understand that there would be a value of a, of a particular initiation ritual that would move you from one mo uh, kind of moment of life to the next, because we're never supposed to have those things. We're not supposed to identify those borders and those boundaries. They're supposed to be constantly fluid and any of that kind of stuff that was a formal spiritual ritual that progressed you through certain stations of life or gave you a particular role, those are all old traditional notions that have been left behind by modern progressive people. Right, exactly. Yeah. There is this notion that the initiation ritual is basically a tribal act that, is, that has been left correctly in, in the, the sort of dark mists of history. But in fact, if you look at the Western tradition from antiquity, from the classical world, initiation rites proliferate in, you know, in the Spartan civilization, in the Athenian civilization, all the way through the Western tradition in one form or another. Um, and, and to this day, the sort of vestiges of that remain. So, you know, something like a baptism is an initiatory ceremony. It is a formalized ceremony that people gather to witness in which um, there is a particular ritual that is played out. Certain words are spoken, uh, certain, um, you know, the individual comes into contact with water. And in, in more traditional forms, uh, you know, if you look at the baptism of Christ himself, he is submerged in the water. Uh, the water rises above his head, and it is this notion of descent into another realm out of which you emerge a new man. Um, so it's a spiritual transformation, it's a physical transformation. Um, and, you know, if you look at the Middle Ages, you have incredibly complex baptismal rites that signify um, all kinds of divisions within society. So you have, uh, in the medieval Catholic Mass, for example, you have the, the, the difference between the Mass of the Catechumens, which is the first part of the Mass, uh, which anyone is allowed to attend, including people that are still preparing for baptism. And then you have the liturgy of the Eucharist, which follows that, which is a more private affair in which uh, the Eucharist is consecrated that only the baptized are allowed to attend. So there's this inherent division of, of society that revolves around this initiatory rite. And these initiation rites, you know, now we think of it in, in fairly silly and indeed often quite evil circumstances with regards to esoteric cults and these things, but they were typical for uh, you know, chivalric initiation, priestly initiation. There were ceremonies that were necessary to ascend the different ranks of the nobility and a, a ceremony that was necessary to become king in many countries. Uh, there was guild initiation, which is professional initiation that went through a process of apprenticeship, tests, uh, professional secrets and, and symbology that was necessary to understand the trade. You know, there were notions of, of initiatory pilgrimages. It's very interesting that you use uh, the example of the, the Disney adult, the sort of perpetual child that is always in this limbic state between being a child and an adult. Because what you've touched on there is, is one of the central aspects of a uh, traditional coming of age rite, which is the ritualistic notion of, uh, of spiritual death. Uh, so this is, you are once a child, you enter for a time into this state of limbo, this was often accompanied by a period in the wilderness or some kind of very arduous physical challenge. And then you emerge out of that a man. And it is this absolute distinction. You are dead to the world for a moment. You were separated from your mother for the period of this, this challenge, this rite. And then you reemerge. You are represented back to society as a man with all of the understandings that have been revealed to you about what the duties of a man are, you are recognized by society, you are reintegrated by society in your new role. And this very definite partition between childhood and adulthood uh, is incredibly stark in, in some of these. Uh, the, the Spartan rites in particular involved a child going out for, for a year uh, into the wilderness to fend for themselves, um, as dramatically portrayed in, in slightly extreme fashion in 300, the film if you've seen that. But there are different gradations of this, but the, the central um, conception is, is that you take a child, you separate them from their mother, all of their uh, infantile support systems, you gather grown men around them, you enter into sacred ground or the wilderness or a church, uh, you make clear to them what their new responsibilities will be, 
and you richly reenact a ceremony. Um, and this is combined with incredibly dramatic proceedings that capture the attention very fully of the initiate, uh, typically, you know, um, dramatic events um, symbolizing death and rebirth, like being subsumed with water. They have a test, they have hardship, whether this is a lack of food or a lack of sleep, and then they emerge back. And this whole sequence, it proves to themselves, it proves to, to others that they are worthy of assuming their new title and they have decisively assumed it. Um, now, the parallels perhaps to the college experience, which is an incredibly weak form of this same process, it's a sort of pseudo initiatory process, uh, may become evident, um, but maybe that's something we could draw out. Yeah, I want to, because I think one of the most important things that you pointed out, it's become a very common thing at this point uh, to, to kind of identify wokeness as a religion. Uh, and one of the things that you point out is that self-annihilation is a critical part of uh, kind of the initiation process. And one of the things that happens during uh, you know this university process is, as you point out, the child is taken away from their parents, often for the first time, right? They leave their parents' household. They live at the university. And kind of their old value system is destroyed. The, the uh, value systems of their parents, the identity given to them by their parents is broken down, destroyed uh, through critical theory. Everything that they learned previously is deconstructed. Now, in reality, this process has already gone on previously because this is scattered throughout our entire educational system at this point and our entire cultural uh, kind of a, a consensus making apparatus follows the same uh, the same process, but but it is most fully realized in this initiation ritual of going to the university and that previous self, those previous connections, that previous understanding of identity, part of the home, part of the family, part of whatever religious or cultural institutions that were, were have still survived modernity in that area, those things are all annihilated. And that person is reborn in kind of this, uh, you know, this fire of the university. They're reforged into another person, another identity. And that is really, I think, a critical thing a lot of people need to understand when when that newly formed creature, you know, there, there's the, uh, the very popular, you know, uh, nice girl before goes into college, comes out, it's, you know, 97 different colors of hair and, you know, 15 new piercings and everything else. Yeah, what happened? It's literally the self-annihilation part of the ritual that you're talking about there. Right, exactly. Um, a lot of the the sort of postmodern academy uh, critical theory is is a is an approach that I think a lot of people will be familiar with. Um, is inherently deconstructive of the myths, the rituals, the identity uh, that underpins our society. So it makes dubious claims that the ideals, the values that we hold most dear are actually intimately integrated within, you know, chauvinistic or colonialist um, power structures, that everything is a power game. Now, what this parallels is in initiatory rituals, one of the most alluring things about them to the young person and one of the most necessary things about them to the broader society is that it is used as the opportunity with which to in providing moral responsibility to the child, to give them the intellectual framework necessary to navigate their newfound moral responsibility. And this involves revealing to them truths that were deemed unsuitable for children. So it's a very empowering experience. They feel like adults for the first time. They feel like they're being revealed hidden knowledge. This is essentially what college professors of the most hostile and egregious kind try and do. They say, everything you thought you knew was a lie your quaint little family in your hometown they've been teaching you these kind of kitsch myths about the history of your society in fact the reality is is that hidden underneath the surface there are these power imbalances there are these forces competing that you couldn't possibly know about until i tell you about them and what they're doing in that instance is they are seizing upon the necessary part of the initiatory uh, ritual that exposes uh, the most sacredly held truths of a society to the initiate for the first time. In a healthy society, you know, when you're going through the process of baptism or confirmation in the Christian sense, you are taking on uh, perhaps a devotion to a particular saint, or you are studying uh, in your catechism uh, the new roles and responsibilities you will have. And this is tethered to the divine, this is tethered to the great saints of the church, this is tethered to a Christian society. 
But in this supposedly secularized approach, instead, there are different saints, quote unquote, that are referenced. There are the heroes of the progressive cause. There is an entire arc of history, um, you know, and, and what's interesting about it, of course, is that typically in, in traditional societies, one would reference a kind of uh, archetype situated in cyclical history, whereas, of course, uh, the, the progressive worldview is one of, of constant progress, and, and that means that uh, their, their sort of entire world conception is, is quite different, which is one of the reasons why the college is not necessarily uh, immediately intuitive as an initiation ritual. But nonetheless, uh, the, the sort of hostile academy takes this opportunity to deconstruct the mythology that, in a very healthy way, underpinned the self-conception of the child and to replace it with the sort of supposed hid hidden truths that reveal the world, the way the world actually works. And that is incredibly, that generates a, a great feeling of empowerment, of maturity in the children, even when it is, in fact, quite unhealthy. And that's, that's how you end up with a situation where some people that have gone to university end up being sort of snide and superior despite making obviously bad life choices, which is how you end up in the situation you mentioned where a very nice young girl or whatever goes off to university and they have made themselves in every way ugly and unpleasant. And yet at the same time, they look down upon you with derision for inhabiting the traditional mode of thought because they have been revealed the sacred truths of the new society, whereas you are still operating under the delusion of the sort of naive ideals of, of a time gone by. Yeah, and, and I think that's again very critical because there's a there is a a line of thought that goes on that says, well, the key is really just the fact that only people on the right are having kids. They're the only ones having family. Literally, one of the uh, critical parts of the left's uh, initiation ritual seems to be your own sterilization through one means or another. And so it, it's only the right that are going to be having children. And so therefore, eventually. Uh, the right will simply outbreed the left. They'll simply re you know, replace the left um, bec because they're the only ones that will have you know, subsequent generations. However, the fact that the left still control the primary means from initiation means that you can have kind of as many kids as you want, but for your children to join kind of the idea, the story of the current society, they must go through a process that completely destroys everything that you would have kind of imbued them with. And, and you know, the as uh, Cicero kind of uh, to butcher Cicero quote that what's the purpose of life unless unless you weave yourself into the history of your forefathers if, you, if you're not joining that great chain of being the story of your society then then you're not really an adult that's that's what transitions you from childhood to adulthood and as long as the left are the ones who are in control of who joins that story who is woven in to that tapestry of our society it doesn't matter if the right has all the kids in the world. Eventually, the left will own them all. Right, exactly. And um, I think it's worth noting here that the implication of this is not we should double down on seizing the universities so that we can wrest control of the one and only initiation ritual away from the left. Um, the universities, as they are currently construed, if we rely upon them as being the primary initiatory mechanism from childhood to adulthood in society, it, pro progressivism is the inevitable output of this. And the reason for that is that higher education, I think we would probably agree, should be uh, a decision that is made by a relatively small percentage of the population. Um, you know, those that really have an aptitude for it that have all of the um, you know, wealth and social class and, and or, or, or just raw intelligence or willpower or whatever that is necessary to be truly exceptional, to attend a truly exceptional level of education in a worthwhile field against a rigorous course. However, if uh, college is to continue serving as the primary initiatory ritual of society, that implies that most children, if not all children, will have to go to college. And of course, the effect of that is a progressive one. Uh, which is uh, one of, of sort of radical equality uh, of, of opportunity and, and outcome across all sectors of society, no matter how much it makes sense. So yeah, instead, the, uh, sorry, yeah, I was just going to say that, that that's that's critical as well because I think a lot of people are stuck in this. You know, they think that this is just going to be the structure of society forever, and they can't imagine a paradigm shift of that you're like the one that you're talking about. And so they think that, oh, well, if you're just sending your kids to trade school, 
then they can never ascend in any elite status. They can never, uh, you know, uh, obtain that which is necessary to actually move forward and in, in, in uh, kind of kind of uh, obtain more more pay or those kind of things. And so, therefore, you know, there, there's only two options. There's, and I, I think as you were going to go into, you know, that we need to find a third way. We need to find a different understanding of how we we uh, have those initiation rituals because if we don't, if we keep locking ourselves into this, the the progressive worldview is a natural a kind of outcome of the system that we currently have set up. Right, exactly. You know, in, in Silicon Valley, there's there's an interesting phenomenon whereby if you graduate from Stanford or MIT in computer science, sorry, if, if you even get into Stanford or MIT in computer science and you attend for a semester or two, you are considered a viable candidate for a venture capitalist to invest in uh, if you want to drop out and start a startup. Now, a lot of that is to do with the selection mechanism that is difficult to get into the university in the first place, and, and that is a sign of competence and intelligence. But a lot of that is to do with the fact that the individual has the self-confidence to start a company in a uh, intelligent way after literally just being accepted and showing up and spending a time on those hallowed grounds in, uh, you know, in, in Palo Alto. Uh, and it's they've 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 gained from that reassurance of their qualification to participate in this echelon of society in this in this what seems like from a distance a very intimidating ecosystem of of um, startups and tech and so forth. But this this mere very short right in their case, you know, they haven't graduated, they haven't spent years there. But the fact that they've been accepted, they've been there, they've stood on those halls, they've listened to those lectures, renews their confidence to go out and pursue these new. Um, these new opportunities in a way that you very rarely see from high school graduates, even though in, in age they're separated by only for a, for a few months. Now, one of the good things about this is, is that for all the, I, I imagine quite a lot of your listeners are thinking this sounds dubious because if you actually think about what university is, most of it is long stretches of not doing much, you know, going to parties, uh, wasting time, playing video games, etc. This doesn't sound like an exotic initiation ritual. And that is, of course, true to a large extent. The university experience uh, suffices as a very weak um, uh, ritual. Uh, you know, you do get this access to the leadership class. You do get initiated into the way that they see the world. You do get to uh, call yourself a graduate alongside the other people that are the aspiring elite of the next generation. Uh, and you do get to leave your home and go to this new place. So it, it has dimensions of this, but it is incredibly weak and, and quite and alluring should a more attractive uh, opportunity come up. And I think that on the right, we have all of the ingredients to make far, far more authentic and compelling versions of these rites of passage, these transitions from childhood into adulthood in a way that will very quickly supersede the spiritual or emotional pull <clears throat> of the university system. And that will open the door uh, for, for exactly the kinds of things that you referenced at the beginning of this talk, which is, you know, uh, other certification programs, just more technical components uh, as well. And the reason for this is, you know, an initiation ritual, to be powerful, does have to have a connection to higher truth, to the divine. It needs to have access to genuinely forbidden truth. It needs to be willing to demarcate the sexes in a way that the, the present uh, academy is very uncomfortable with. It needs to embrace a conception that the young must go through a period of hardship, even physical hardship. I don't know if you saw the thread on leftists uh, exercising a couple of days ago where every single one of them was having a meltdown, but that's sort of illustrative of, uh, of how intolerant the other side of the aisle is with regards to uh, intentionally undergoing physical hardship. We recognize the particularity of community, which uh, these rituals are most powerfully tethered within. And of course, most fundamentally, we recognize the importance of tradition and ritual. Um, and all of this, you know, we would have to move through this sort of uh, aura of postmodern skepticism that infuses our, our present moment and that makes forming intentional rituals uh, more difficult than it would have been in, in a sort of more naive pre-modern society. But uh, for other reasons, I believe that's absolutely possible. But I think we should have a lot of self-confidence on the right that we are capable of making something genuinely alluring out of this opportunity. I think your point about uh, particularity is, well, particularly important there. And, and I think it's because a lot of the thinness of this ritual, a lot of, you know, as you said, that this 
college barely qualifies and only really exists as one because we've destroyed every other one is because of the massification of our society is because of we we've, we've scaled up society to a point where we can't apply particular rituals we we you know the the story of us leaving the behind for in progress is a functional one for our ruling ideology because it tells us that we no longer need the particular we no longer need the tribal we already no longer need the the, you know, the close knit community we can just scale everything out we can we can take everything into the wider uh, kind of global empire. And so that one of the reasons that college, you know, uh, does fill that slot is because we've annihilated all those others because it was, nece it was necessary for us to, to scale society to this level. And I would say that you're right, that most of the, the things that are truly valuable in an initiation ritual are things that the right owns, because it's the only thing, because those are all the things that the left has excluded in order to kind of create this homogenous global uh, gray goo society however one thing that i think you know and this is just a problem that that i recognize from you know observing this across many different domains is that while i think the, the key to the future is indeed in particularity one of the problems we run into is that at this point massification and and a kind of larger scale the mass man still wins against the particular in the moment. I think we, we're going to get to an inflection point where that's no longer the case. And maybe we'll do it. Ca it'll cascade across many domains, including that of initiation rituals, education, these things. But as we stand at the moment, unfortunately, the particular still seems to lose to the mass man and the mass initiation ritual probably wins over the particular one at the moment simply because of that. Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think actually, conversely, initiation rituals, and apologies for my voice, by the way, as you can tell, uh, my two-year-old son has made me incredibly sick in the last 24 hours, so uh, apologies if, if I'm coming across. I sound a bit like a 70-year-old woman here. But um, one of the things, if we think about what we really value in initiation rituals, uh, both as individual participants, but also as society that attempts to integrate the individuals coming out of those rituals, we value... Uh, I want a ritual that will instill in me a great degree of self-confidence, a strong self-conception that will associate me with people that I regard as virtuous and beautiful, uh, the other initiates coming out of the, the ritual that I'm participating in. Um, I want something that proves that I'm up to the task of life um, and that commands respect in the eyes of my elders and wider society. And I really do think we are coming to a head with regards to the university uh, as ability to, to to generate any of those those effects, um, and in fact, to generate respect in an older person, uh, and to to give an individual a confident self conception, you don't need a grand ritual. You don't need a year years long process. It's I mean, it's all very well to to point to the high middle ages or mature, you know, like Hergus of Sparta and say, look at these incredible historic rituals they had. But those are the rituals of a mature civilization at the height of their, their summer. And that's not where we are. We're, we're, we're in winter. Um, and, and so you can start small. I mean, you know, this is to, to take it all the way small. In fact, too small to be terribly useful to this discussion, but it's what springs to mind. Um, you know, I've done Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in the past. I imagine some of your audience has the same. And in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, there's this concept called the gauntlet. And what the gauntlet is, is when you ascend a belt level, when you transition from white belt to blue belt, blue belt to purple belt, and so on, all the way up to black belt, you have to run the gauntlet. And this is walking down a long strip where all of your fellow classmates, your fellow students, whip you violently with their belts. Uh, and it's painful, it's brutal. Sometimes people get really sadistic about it. Um, but it does serve as this function whereby everyone respects the person coming out of the other end of that as someone that has put in the time to graduate to this new level and has the bravery to undergo genuine pain to receive the new belt and conversely for the individual that is now accepting a higher status position within that micro society they are being taught that they are not fundamentally or metaphysically better than those around them that they still uh, share, you know, they're not untouchable to those around them, that they still share and physically inhabit a space with those other people, they mustn't look down on them, and that there are circumstances in which even those people have lower belts, um, 
you know, can can harm them, can touch them, and so it sort of rounds out this whole this whole society. Now that's that's a that's a terribly small example, but it does show that in fact these things, these these small economies of respect and self conception and status and hierarchy, emerge organically in uh, even very very small instances. And as the ability of, you know, one, one of the things that I think you're seeing now is the fundamental ability of the academy to produce mentally stable uh, graduates is eroding to the point where it is genuinely worrying for an employer. If they employ people from certain fairly common studies, if they're going to get someone that is actively antagonistic to, you know, other actors within their organization, it's a common problem as a, as a hiring manager. Um, and so that that side of things really is going downhill. So I think this this sort of like more. I completely agree with you with regards to the massification of society and the advantages of economies of scale when it comes to manufacturing, when it comes to large scale physical systems. But this more spiritual and psychological dimension, I think, is actually a real opportunity for us. No, I agree. Like I said, I I think that that is um, we are going to hit an inflection point. Like you said, we you basically have colleges that are just mental illness factories at this point. And you, know, you, you can talk about the, uh, you know, kind of the importance of that initiation ritual for moving into some high level business. But if the only people you're churning out are those that are just completely mentally damaged at some point, uh, pe people just functionally have to turn to something else. And, and I think you're right that uh, in the right has, has much better options uh, for, for people to kind of turn to there. I want to ask you one more thing before we go to the questions of the people. This is a, there's a perennial discussion online, and I, I know that you've thought about this some, so I want to pick, you, pick your brain a little on it. There's a lot of people who look at our current situation. They look at many of the initi initiation rituals that now you know sit in at the heart of our society. Uh, you know, as you said, the the university system really only being one. And they say that the reason that we've been in the state, the reason that we arrive here is really that Christianity hollowed out the West, that it was the reason that we ended up here. It's too weak. It's too submissive. It can't create men. It can't form the kind of initiation rituals that you're talking about because it's a fundamentally uh, kind of effeminate or submissive uh, religion. And therefore, there, there's no way for people to go through the kind of gauntlet that you're you're talking about. And that, you know, while it may have at some point uh, been rougher because it was more in in concert with other pagan roots. Now it's just kind of achieved its final form, and and the West has to has to jettison this Christianity if they ever want to create the kind of meaningful transitional rituals that you're talking about again. What would you say to people who take that tack? It's interesting, yeah. Uh, so so to put my cards on the table, I'm a, a practicing and fairly devout Christian, a Catholic. Um, let let me acknowledge the truth in that criticism up front. So relying on Christianity alone uh, in the absence of wider social structures of support for these initiatory processes uh, is, is always bound to fail. Um, because the, you know, fundamentally, the truth of Christianity is that it should be openly proclaimed. It's, it's a missionary and a universalistic religion. And relying on it for these more secret or selective initiation rituals tends to foster Gnostic and, and other heresies, which are, you know, you end up in esoteric pointlessness and weirdness uh, very quickly. Um, and, and at the same time, you know, if you look at a society like America, this Christian weakness with regards to initiatory rituals has been compounded by, rightly or wrongly, by Protestant skepticism of, of sort of ritual and mysticism. And equally on, on my side of the fence, uh, really everywhere in Christianity, uh, a very a sort of Catholic desire to move with the times, to be seen as a church of the present, you know, that's modern and approachable and part of the moment and culturally relevant. And this is to live in history instead of outside of it. And what, a, what an initiation ritual should be is a temporary transcendence of the present moment to inhabit a sacred space, to revivify the ancient uh, sort of myths of one society, and to inhabit a perennial archetype for a time so that when you return to the world, um, you are uh, better able to perform the mature function that you've been initiated into. Um, now, all of that is true. So what I don't want to suggest is that, you know, if we, for example, look up old chivalric initiation rituals, um, 
and we attempt to revive them. Like I put my son through a process where I expected him to kneel in front of an altar all night long with a sword on the altar, praying and meditating. I mean, I might get him to do that actually. That sounds pretty good, but <laughs> um, it, I don't think that's going to turn him into a knight. And, and fundamentally, I think that we live in a culture that is very well attuned to irony, that that is fundamentally, for better or worse, a, a postmodern um, society. And I think, frankly, rightly, we see such a thing as ridiculous as LARPing. So whatever the path forward is, it is not as simple as wholesale, wholesale um, attempting to revivify the particular ways that Christianity and the elements of Christianity intersected with the particulars of the various societies um, of the Western, Western history. Like you can't just uh, revivify these old initiatory rites wholesale. The question becomes, what is the genuine expression of Christianity um, in its true and perennial form that is best suited to meet the moment and to meet the needs of that moment. And what is undeniable is that Christianity throughout its history, um, you know, it, it goes without saying that the, the Christian men of the Crusades and the Reconquista and so on uh, were strong, self-confident, pious men uh, who were also capable of, of defending their own and, you know, standing up for what they believed in. There's this idea that ancient Christians uh, were in some way different, that they were weak, that the church fathers of, of the early years, you know, Tertullian and Origen and so forth, uh, fundamentally were pacifists. I think we should be very skeptical of that view. Uh, in fact, I think that they were making an incredibly principled, brave, and arduous decision to allow themselves uh, to be killed within the context of the Roman Empire. They willingly sacrificed themselves and faced very bravely to a man died, you know, facing horrific deaths and torture by, by the various um, emperors that persecuted Christianity. And that was in no way a cowardly thing. That wasn't a soft thing. They suffered terrible hardships for their faith. What you see is that, in fact, both of these different um, instances of different expressions of masculine virtue were the intersection of genuine expressions of Christian faith and Christian living with the requirements of the time. So in, um, in the Roman Empire, it was not possible for Christians to join the military for various reasons. Um, and it, it, framing that as like pacifism isn't quite right. The, the, the Roman army was fundamentally a pagan institution that required pagan sacrifices, uh, that was saturated with a pagan calendar that required uh, recognizing emperors at various times as divine beings and so forth. It, it fundamentally was was philosophically and theologically irreconcilable with Christianity. And so instead, in defending their faith, in truly living out their faith, in in maximizing the authenticity with which they approach their faith, the men of the of Christian well, and women, of course, um, you know, saints like uh, uh, Perpetua and Felicity went to their deaths incredibly bravely as well. Um, but they expressed uh, an incredible intensity of belief that translated into radical physical action and strength in a different way to those later generations of knights uh, and, and of the Christian men that fought the world wars and so forth. Now, the question then becomes is, what is the intersection of authentic, radical belief that gives you such strength of conviction that you are willing to die to a man for what you believe in. And we are short of that right now, combined with the genuine demands of the moment. And how do you meet those two in a way that is authentic, where you are not politicizing your faith, neither are you uh, misinterpreting your faith in a way to try and make it overly amenable to modernity, to friendly and so forth. But I will promise you this, Time and time again, the history of Christianity has shown that it can produce men and women of the utmost ferocity of belief, that are willing to kill for their beliefs, that are willing to die for their beliefs in, in horrible and strange circumstances. And for us in the present moment, you know, on Twitter or whatever, and I'm as guilty of this as the next person, to think, oh, that's not strong enough. We need something stronger. We need something, you know, we need pagan imperialism or whatever. It's, it's just silly. Like it, Christianity, if you learn Christian history, there is real strength there. The question is only how do we find that strength in ourselves and how do we express it in a way that is suitable for the present moment? Absolutely. All right, guys. Well, we're going to transition over to the questions of the people. But before we do, Johan, can you tell people where to find your excellent work? 
Uh, sure, yeah, you can find me at becomingnoble.substack.com, or if you just Google my name, you, you should find it pretty quickly. Excellent. All right. So Florida Henry says, rite of passage, uh, another tradition that boomers threw in the garbage firsthand, uh, firsthand, this has been destroyed in the military and fire service. Yeah, well, a lot of that stuff is now called hazing, right? You're you're not allowed to have what used to be very common uh, rituals. In, in fact, that was like the whole uh, premise of a movie, uh, you know, uh, right? A Tom Cruise movie is that these things are no longer allowed. A certain level of, of that is not allowed. Uh, it, and so those those institutions that might have once allowed might have once perpetuated this idea of a rite of passage has had has had that stripped out even of their more traditional structure. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, if you look at um, there are still aspects of initiation into parts of military life that still hold this incredible appeal. You know, buds is legendary. Everyone knows who buds is. I know what buds is, and I didn't grow up in the U.S. And that is because. It is a series of tests that are conducted in the most extreme and horrendous circumstances. And if you come out the other side of it, you get to call yourselves a seal. And everyone knows what a seal is. And so that, as an initiatory right, is still incredibly powerful. You know, one of the interesting things about the US military is that uh, the more that the focus of the material, that, that recruiting material, the advertising material, focuses on war fighting, on killing, on the military's true purpose, which is the defense of the United States or whatever country you come from, the higher the recruitment rate, even absent other incentives. So if you break down the different forces in the, in the US, I, I did this once as a sort of interesting exercise, what you see is that even those that offer significant in, uh, signing bonuses, educational bonuses, um, and this is you know the Army and the Air Force, really struggled to hit their recruiting targets, whereas the Marines, you know, uh, and, and the various uh, more elite units smash them because they have that respect. They have that, uh, even though greater hardship is uh, understood to be attached to that, even though the financial incentives might be lower, even though the danger is higher, there is a prestige of joining that um, that is that is essential to the self-conception uh, of the individual that actually wants to join the military in the first place. That's right. And that's why the ideological purging of those exact same units has been so devastating to military recruitment, because the very people who would be spurred on by exactly the kind of material that you're talking about are, are no longer allowed inside the military or are, are heavily dissuaded. And it doesn't matter how many signing bonuses you go ahead and tack on for other groups. Those aren't the ones that really want to fill those elite ranks. And those are the things that really do spur people to to make that choice. Uh, Seneca here says, uh, Johan, life used to be full of uh, little daily rituals by which you planned your day. How would you re-implement those rituals with your family? That's a great question, yeah. Um, and hi, Seneca. I recognize you from my Substack, assuming it's the same one, but you've got the same profile picture, so I'm assuming it is. Great to see you here. Um, some, some become obvious. You know, uh, there are some activities that are recognized uh, as obviously healthier, um, psychologically speaking, spiritually speaking, the alternatives. An example would be sitting down as a family to have a meal and having no devices on, no TV on, eating at the same time as a family, speaking to each other as human beings, looking at each other and inhabiting the same space. So that's a, that's a sort of physical example. Um, maybe to make it more personal, in my prayer life, um, I at this point, you know, I've been I've been praying for so long. I've sort of developed a repertoire of different prayers I pray, and they, there's a sequence to them that I pray at every day. And I've sort of observed over time where I need particular support, and I've incorporated prayers um, into those. So, for example, I always start out uh, the morning with the prayer to Saint Michael the Archangel, uh, which is to ask for his intercession in battle, defending us in Proelio. It's a very, very powerful uh, prayer in Latin. Um, and I follow that with, you know, I pray that my grandfather, who is a great war hero, is uh, is looking over me and praying for me as well. And, and then I, I sort of go through there, the Our Father, of course, and, and so forth. But it's it's about developing a personal connection. And my son, in turn, is, is praying with me now. And it's, it's about developing these little rituals that are not artificial, they're not forced, uh, they are genuinely healthy and they sort of reinstantiate themselves because they're enjoyable, because they're meaningful, because they're relevant to the moment. I don't think what would work is, you know, buying a book of like 
the way that kings had dinner in the Middle Ages and attempting to reincorporate some of that into into your particular life, it's very important not to to allow this to devolve into laughing because it is it is fundamentally such a healthy and human thing to do. It's not necessary. Yeah, I think you're right that just finding those moments that that work into your day and and make sense, but but also communicate that togetherness and that ritual are absolutely key. A creeper weirdo here, creeper weirdo says. Uh, those old rituals were low class, but you know what's high class? Consumerism, hypersexuality, and self-centeredness. Every man is an island and nothing matters. No, you have crippling depression. Yeah, no, that, as amazing as that sounds, that is pretty much exactly what has managed to be sold to our society. Uh, Daedalus says, college is just a voluntary blood tax that you pay for uh, so the regime can uh, have a never-ending supply of janissaries. Uh, yes, but also, as I think Johan critically pointed out, it, it's also so much more than that. And until we have a way to uh, kind of step in and, and uh, substitute uh, a much more powerful spiritual ritual as something that can, can transition people from one moment of life to another, they will continue to fall back on that. Uh, you know, No matter how hollow it seems, no matter how much of a, a bad investment it seems, people will continue to pay that tax as long as it's the only way that they have to kind of join uh, that higher status or uh, make that transition from one mode of being to the next. Yeah, completely agree. A uh, creeper weirdo again here says pagan cope is so cringe. It's like, who do you think gave you the, the memory of pagan rituals to begin with? It wasn't uh, Crowley. I'll tell you that. Uh, yeah, it, it is. There is this nasty uh, tendency uh, to, to kind of cloak a little bit of new, th to new atheism in uh in kind of this idea of neo-paganism uh, don't get me wrong there are people who genuinely believe in it there are some who do actually practice it um and then that is a a far more uh real version of that uh but but the people who are just using it as a kind of a a shield uh for their uh for their kind of new atheism is always kind of tiresome well Ron, i think uh, i think the all caps means he expects you to shout the comment at the camera i'm sure he does that's true but creeper weirdo has, has known by now probably that i'm, I'm not going to do that but uh but i appreciate it uh seneca says uh great uh good stream gents uh cheers from missouri well thank you very much sir definitely appreciate it and uh, Sky Dancer, the boomer rite of passage is losing virginity. Yeah, I mean, that that's was definitely something that was emphasized very heavily uh, in that generation. Though I'm going to I'm going to just say, to be fair, I think that is a pretty common rite of passage uh, in, in pretty much all cultures, uh, whether we realize it or not. But the very crass version of it in uh, a kind of the modern sense, uh, in the way that we've kind of made that such a very cheap rite of passage. Uh, probably makes it uh, you know, just just seem strictly vulgar, uh, but I do think that that is that is one that has existed pretty much across all cultures in one way or another. Uh, so I would I wouldn't just throw that away and dismiss that as ridiculous, but I would say the current version of it is so low and crass as to to make it easy to do so. If if I can make one observation on that front, I, I think it's actually a very interesting subject. Mm -hmm. Primarily, what we've spoken about today are male coded initiation rituals, but if you look at the history of female initiation rituals, they they typically, I won't go too into detail because it's perhaps not the right forum to discuss, but they typically center around uh, physical coming of age for girls and how to deal with their, their coming fertility. And it's much more of a private affair. It's much more of a personal affair in part because that happens at different ages for different girls. And they're taken away by older women into seclusion and they go through ritual purification and they are taught how to process uh, the advent of their fertility in, in a sort of meaningful and healthy way that contributes to the wider people and, and that prepares them for family formation and so forth. We have the opposite of that in our society, which is we have a series of anti-fertility initiation rituals uh, throughout you know, the school years that basically is, is like sex ed, which is like, here's how you stop um, you know, uh, conception at all costs. And then you go to university and you have uh, you know, radical uh, pro-choice movements and so forth. So you're, you're sort of reverse initiated away from um, ideals. Very true. Very good insight. Uh, Roll Pepper says, baptism seems to be Pro uh, Protestants' main method of initiation and is often done young. Any thoughts on how to create more? It's tough. Uh, I'm probably not the right person to ask. I, so 
I'll, I'll give a critical perspective because that's what I'm equipped to do, but I'm sure I'm not doing the subject justice and that some of my, my well-informed Protestant friends um, would be able to give a more positive vision. One of the things about the Protestant ethos and the genesis of Protestantism was this skepticism of ritual, of the centrality of tradition as an over, overbearing factor in, that got in the way of man's personal and rightful relationship with the divine. Uh, and if you move towards that more individuated approach to religion, then these more archetypical, formal, and mandatory processes uh, sort of recede into the into the distance. Whereas if you look at the religious traditions like Eastern Orthodox, Eastern Orthodoxy or Catholicism, that are much more acquainted with ritual and that have these different gradations of initiation. So, in Catholicism, at least, you know. Um, you have baptism, but then you also have First Holy Communion, which is typically when you're about seven. You might have confirmation a few years after that, um, and, and so on and so forth. So there's this kind of evolving continuation of ritual. Now, none of those are sufficient for the reasons I said earlier. The, the Catholic Church, as with pretty much every other church, is not doing a good job at providing a fully fleshed out initiation ritual into adulthood. But I think Protestantism in particular will have to derive their sources of initiation from processes other than the faith itself. I mean, obviously, you still want to reflect their faith, but they will have to turn to other sources, uh, institutional sources, community sources, um, traditional sources, and so forth. But I don't think they'll emerge organically out of the Protestant faith. I think there's some truth to that as somebody who is Southern Baptist and, and you know, grew up Protestant. Uh, I would say that while, the, the, you know, there's probably less ritual directly tied to the church and that, it, like, as you said, that is intentional, uh, there are uh, alternatives that do emerge inside the church. Uh, the transition to to deacon or elder is one that I think is probably a critical one to point to. Many of the organizations that are uh, inside the church uh, often have the that kind of transition to leadership or that transition uh, from a, you know a childlike role inside the church to one that is more of a adult coded role in the church community. And so while I think the probably the more what we would think of as uh, ancient ritual aspect of the church certainly doesn't exist uh, to the extent that it does in, say, the, you know, the more orthodox uh, faith, I think that those opportunities still do exist. And I think many of them uh, are tied very deeply to the civic organization, which is why, you know, de, uh, de Tocqueville saw that as such a critical part of the American formation uh, of civic life. And I think that that is... Uh, probably the Protestant display uh, of the kind of ritual or transition that you're talking about. Yep. We've got glow in the dark here. He says, what happened to the ritual of fixing up your own car? I found it therapeutic, uh, rhetorical, but I miss being able to work on my car without having to remove 30% of the engine to reach something. Yeah, this really was a critical part. Like I remember this. Yeah. I got a really old car cause it was all I could afford uh, when I, when I was young, when I was uh, 16 and work in a, uh, you know, part-time job. And, uh, you know, it broke down almost immediately. And so I had to learn how to change a water pump and, and a thermostat. And it was so old that there wasn't a, a large amount of computers and everything between me and all of those parts. And so even though I'm not particularly mechanically gifted, I was able to learn all that stuff. And that was a rite of initiation to a degree. You had to learn how to care and maintain this thing that gave you a certain degree of independence uh, I think the really interesting thing is that most of that has gone away for, for a couple different reasons. One is that younger generations today, this has been remarked on by many people, I mentioned this in, in actually my last stream, is that many of the younger generations, you know, Zoomers and, and, and younger, aren't, weren't even interested in getting their driver's license in the U.S. You know, as young as they could, as where when I was a kid, this was a critical part of your transition to, to uh, kind of semi-adulthood. Uh, and uh, frankly, automotive ownership is more and more out of reach. The, the, the prices, inflation, uh, the upkeep, the maintenance, all of these things have pushed these, uh, you know, these things out of ownership. And finally, you just don't have dads teaching kids how to, how to fix this kind of stuff anymore. You don't have that transitional uh, knowledge where, you know, the, your, your dad or your grandpa, you know, pulled you aside and said, this is how you, you get under the, the, the hood of the car and fix those things because you can outsource that to you know a cheap labor or what used to be cheap labor but isn't anymore and so i think these are all kind of multiple things that have stripped away 
uh, not just in the automotive sense, but but all kinds of senses, whether it be home maintenance, uh, the lack of ownership and the lack of therefore the lack of maintenance means the lack of that transition to adulthood by caring for your own possessions. Yeah, if you I mean, if you what you're talking about isn't an initiation ritual as such, it's, it's more of a sort of therapeutic or, or um, uh, yeah, a different kind of ritual. But the characteristics of a ritual of the kind you're talking about are something that you can sink into, that you can relax into, that you can inhabit unselfconsciously because you're familiar with it, because you've been taught to do it, because you've done it again and again, just as your father did it and so on. And it becomes this sort of very uh, soothing and, and, um, and reassuring activity to sink into. And if you look at the Zoomers, uh, as with many physical and indeed digital tasks, um, Zoomers are surprisingly bad software engineers because they really get into the nuts and bolts of um, of having, you know, 20 years ago, we had to fix our own computers and, you know, to, to download, to pirate something, you had to like download, uh, you know, VPN, get into the, download some kind of flat converter or whatever to, to get a video to play. Now, if you've got Netflix, you can, there's a smooth front end for everything. So you're not digging into the nuts and bolts of the machine. Returning to the example of the car, I think a lot of Zoomers, and it, this isn't a criticism of them, it's not their fault, it's societal processes that are bringing this about, but they they find it much more difficult to unselfconsciously sink into and relax into the physical and mechanical world because of all the structures uh, that uh, Oron noted have, have degraded. So even if they were to engage in that activity, what might be a ritual for you wouldn't be a ritual for them because it's, it doesn't bear that repetitive and familiar feeling that a ritual is supposed to. Instead, it would be a, 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 an intentional activity and, and perhaps a challenging and difficult one, even a frightening one, um, which is not to say that that isn't something that shouldn't be taken on and surmounted, but it wouldn't be a, a ritual. It wouldn't feel the same way that it would to someone that had been raised in that circumstance. Right, right. All right, guys. Uh, let, oh, one more super chat. We'll make this the last one, guys. Thank you very much. I appreciate your questions. Well, in the dark follows up and says, uh, speaking specifically to church rit rituals, I don't remember the last time a church organized to help a fellow member, like building a ramp for disabled grandmothers or doing a fundraiser for co uh, for college kid. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know about your personal experience, glow in the dark, but that's the kind of thing that my church does all the time. One of the reasons that I, that I like being involved in it. So. If that if that's not a part of a church ritual, then uh, you know I think you you might need to find a, a better church because that sounds like a church that's not uh, that's not fulfilling a critical role in in its community. All right, guys, we're gonna go ahead and wrap this up. But Johan, thank you once again for coming on. Everybody should definitely go and check out his excellent Substack. And of course, if this is your first time on the YouTube channel, make sure that you go ahead and subscribe. Make sure to turn on notifications, click that bell so you know when these streams go live. And if you'd like to get these broadcasts as podcasts, you can make sure to subscribe to the Aura McIntyre Show on your favorite podcast platform. When you do, make sure to leave that rating and review. It helps with the algorithms. Thanks for coming by, guys. And as always, I'll talk to you next time.